in the digital world we all live in with our phones now now you can get um apps to where you can see what your fence is doing it'll send you can set it up where it can send some alerts so if you're traveling or whatever um or get up in the morning when you're drinking your coffee you can actually see what the voltage is on your fence with certain energizers and having the apps and there's wireless things and they can lights and sirens i mean there's lots of things electric fence can do now with the technology that's become available that makes our lives a lot easier being able to see what's going on remotely from a fence hey hey it's Shay Keister, and I'm your host and the founder of Casual Cattle Conversations, a global rancher education company that strives to bring honest thoughts and conversations from ranchers and leaders to other ranchers. Be sure to follow Cattle Convos on social media to have more in-depth conversations around the ranching business and lifestyle brought to you. If you are ready to take your operation to the next level and improve your lifestyle too, send me a message about my Rancher Mind group. Rancher Minds are monthly roundtable discussions for ranchers to learn from peers and experts and leave the call with actionable advice to make changes on their own operations. With that, let's see who our guest is today and what experience and advice they have to offer you to improve your own operation. All right, Lee. Well, thank you for joining the show today. And, you know, we've chatted on the phone a little bit before, but I'd really like for you just to briefly share with my audience, you know, a couple sentences. What is your role in the beef industry today? Well, I have a handful of commercial cattle myself, but so everything that goes along with that. But I am a territory manager for Gallagher. So I play a pretty good sized role with a lot of producers helping them design, set up systems, solve problems. A lot this year with the drought is, um, you know, trying to stretch their grass as far as possible and imp imp implementing systems that help them do that. Yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, a lot of areas in our country are facing drought this year. And uh, like, I guess we talked earlier, that is just a part of ranching. It's bound to happen mm -hmm. at some point. Now, today we're gonna just kind of quickly talk about power fencing. So when we're talking about power fencing, what does that mean? I mean, what is power fencing in your own words? Well, there's, there's really three ways to look at power fencing or electric fence. Um, power fencing is kind of the term we try to use because it sounds less scary to the general public than electric. Um, but of course there's permanent, there's temporary, and there's offset fencing that you can use. Um, put a power fence on an existing fence to some lease ground where it's fallen down or some old fence to where you can, you know, plug holes for little to no money um, to get the most out of your fence. So there's two ways to look at it, in my opinion, it just depends on the situation. Do you wanna describe a little bit each of those three ways, just go into a little more detail on what each of those three sure. ways looks like? Sure. So, of course, permanent fence would be just like you'd put up a barbed wire or woven wire fence. You have your brace assemblies and you're going to stretch multiple strands of wire um, and it's meant to be there for long term. Um, you're going to use the, you know, the high tensile or or a steel wire um, and it's just meant to be there. Uh, temporary is going to be your poly wires, your poly tapes, um, going to be with some step in posts or something that's, you know, temporary. Um, and you're going to use, it's going to be in a smaller area or something that's designed to be moved often. So you're not going to want to have to deal with your heavy steel wires and, and driving a lot of posts and things like that. It's, it's like, it's, like the word is temporary. It's meant to be temporary and move easily moved. And then offset fencing would be where you took an existing traditional fence of whichever you want, barbed wire, woven wire, board, doesn't matter. And you're going to put a bracket on it. Uh, of some stature and you're going to put a single or two strands of of, hot, of power fence wire down it to protect it keep animals from reaching through rubbing oh rub, rubbing on it leaning over you know even if it's a brand new fence it's going to extend the life of it because they're not going to be pushing on it um, it's also useful in the offset situation if you're 
trying to separate pastures where you're not having co-mingling with a bull or some heifers or things like that. Um, or you, you don't want your neighbor's bull over there sniffing on your cows and things like that. That works great in that situation. Well, thank you. I appreciate hearing that because a common theme on the show is there's more than one way to do something and not the same system's not going to work for everything. So I appreciate Absolutely. hearing those different methods. So when we look at power fencing as a whole, what tools or technologies are critical to making sure that implementing power fencing is a success for ranches? The biggest thing I hear um, in 15 years of working for Gallagher, I get more calls or more questions or more issues are caused by grounding. Um, improper grounding of an energizer is the biggest common denominator of, of issues. Um, and it's more prevalent in the summer and in drought situations because um, the earth is not as conductive when, the, when, the, when it's dry dirt or you know the grass isn't as flush and things like that. So grounding you, is the cheapest part of the, of the power fence system and it's the part that gets uh, shortchanged most often. Well, awesome. And I know that's something that we've talked about on the show before, actually, mm -hmm. uh, probably be about a month, six weeks, a month or six weeks in before this um, episode gets released. But that was something that was really talked about. And I know something that my family uses a lot of power fencing. So that's something we have to watch, too. So when you look at that, so you talked about the ground, that's critical. Mm -hmm. So on the energizer side, how do producers know what type of energizer is going to be best for them? Well, you got to you got to look at a couple different things. The the size of the area you're going to be fencing. Um, also, when you think about the size of the area you're going to be fencing, <clears throat> are you going to add to it down the road? Um, you don't want to go buy a fence of uh, an energizer for the piece of ground that you're going to fence this year and then next year add on more or something to where you just buy one that's big enough for what you're doing now think to the future um because you can't have too big of an energizer so if you think down the road you're going to be tying into it and adding more ground to it or more area and building more fence and wanting to use that same energizer think about that so that you're not shortchanging yourself and having to go back a a year to you know a few years down the road and start over with a bigger energizer um but you also got to think about if you can plug in or if you need a solar unit so if you can plug in it's going to be you're going to get more bang for your buck because you take the batteries and the solar panels and things like that out of the equation um but sometimes you get out in remote grant remote country and there's not a power source so solar is your only option so that's the biggest biggest two things to me is can you can you plug in do you have a power source and think about the whole the whole total area that you will be fencing now and down the road so that you can buy the right energizer well awesome so going back to that you know the amount of area that's going to be fenced is there a certain point where the solution for getting more bang for your buck more power on that fence is that you also need to have more of a ground or is that more reliant on the energizer itself what how how do you weigh the you know amount of power going through the fence as far as you know the grounding system compared mm -hmm. to the energizer okay the larger the energizer the more ground system you're going to need and that's directly related to if you have a big energizer you're probably covering a good amount of area so if you think of your ground system like a cb radio antenna um the bigger your antenna is, the better signal you're going to get from a further distance, right? So large energizer, more ground rods, because if that cow is standing all the way in the back 40 that could be a mile away or two miles away from that energizer, you need a bigger, a bigger ground system, a bigger net to catch the electrons coming back to make it all, of, all effective. So small area, small energizer, the, you know, lesser amount of ground rods you need. So think of it like that um it's it's pretty easy start with three ground rods and you won't have a problem most of the time 
Well, thank you for sharing that. So, you know, you already mentioned that grounding was one of the biggest mistakes, you know, that you hear ranchers make. What are some of those, you know, is there one or two other mistakes that you'd really like to bring to light today that are common with the power fencing strategies or systems, I should say? Yeah. um, uh, Steel posts, they're used a lot and there's nothing wrong with them. Um, Using a quality insulator, if you're going to use a steel post, whether it's a T-post or rebar or pipe, um, you get what you pay for when it comes to insulators and the insulation properties of them, um, the longevity of them from sitting out in the sun and cracking and things like that. A lot of people spend all that money building a fence and and buy an inexpensive insulator and it fails a couple years down the road. And then they're having to go back and replace and spend all the time again and all that stuff. So you get what you pay for when it comes to plastics in the insulator. Um, Also is not having a electric fence tester to where you can test your fence with the proper tool so that when you reach out to reach out for help to somebody, whether it's calling the manufacturer or energizer or calling the territory manager like myself, you know, if you can't tell me what that fence is reading with a digital voltmeter, it's harder for me to help you. Um, because an electrician's meter will not read electric fence accurately, accurately. So having the proper tools to provide all the information to get the best help for you. Well, thank you for sharing that. So Is there anything in the power fencing space that you're excited for as far as any new technologies um, coming out? Yeah, um, there's in the digital world we all live in with our phones. Now now you can get um, apps to where you can see what your fence is doing. It'll send you can set it up where it can send some alerts. So if you're traveling or whatever um, or get up in the morning while you're drinking your coffee, you can actually see what the voltage is on your fence with certain energizers and having the apps and there's wireless things and they can lights and sirens. I mean, there's lots of things electric fence can do now with the technology that's become available that makes our lives a lot easier being able to see what's going on remotely from a fence. Well, that's pretty cool to hear, especially for those folks out there that have rented pasture quite a ways Mm -hmm. away. Um, definitely oh, yeah. save some miles and time for them and the fuel prices that's that's pretty awesome <laughs> you can save Absolutely. Trip over there. being able to being able to make sure your fence is working or get a get an alert if something's down or you know that your vo- voltage fell below your preset level or whatever to where you can go find something fix it before you know say a car runs through the fence you can go you you're going to know pretty quick that your voltage is off so you can go find it hopefully before something gets out, but you don't need to drive out there every day like we used to have to at $6 diesel. Absolutely. Well, Lee, as we kind of wrap up today, you know, I'd just really like to ask you know, where can producers go for more resources um, mm-hmm. as far as finding these tools and technology, learning more about them? Where can those ranchers go? Well, of course, you can, the internet's a wonderful tool. Um, there's all kinds of YouTube videos and how to's and of course you can go to Gallagher's website and there's um, instructional videos and downloads and things on there as long as a fence building tool to where you know if you really don't know what you need you can answer a bunch of questions and and your footages and things like that and it'll spit you out a material list and give you a starting point but internet's a wonderful tool and then of course you can always reach out to wherever you live Gallagher has a territory manager in every state so you can reach out to us for advice and your local extension office and NRCS and things like that is has got a boatload of information is available as well. Well, awesome. Thank you very much for being on the show. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I appreciate it. Anything we can ever do, let us know. All righty. And that's a wrap on that one. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on the episode. And if you have any further questions around the topic, take care and have a great day.